We're going to go over CVE 11882, which is commonly known as the Microsoft Equation Editor bug. Uh, if you all have any questions on this video or anything else, hit us up at ringzerolabs.com and we'd be happy to help out. Uh, so I, I was sitting on this content for a while, didn't make the video, and then I got a uh, YouTube subscription notification that Colin Hardy um, had uploaded the basically the exact same video that I was about to upload this one on this very uh, this same exploit. So, kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of other people have, have done this as well, but uh, I highly suggest checking out Colin Hardy's video. I'll have a link in the description below. He goes over in great detail about stacks and how buffer overflows work, and he has great depictions of it, so I highly suggest watching that before you watch this. This is going to be a little more skimmed over uh, since he did such a great job in that. Uh, but first, what we're going to do is just show what the... Uh, CVE document does. So this is how it will show up to the end user. It will just be a document and an email or something like that. If you run it, Microsoft Office is going to open. All right. And then we see this program right here. This is, this is the vulnerable program. This is known as Equation Editor. Equation Editor was written a very long time ago and it has virtually zero protections and, and a lot of things wrong with it. But one very specific thing that has wrong with it is it has a buffer overflow in a, in a uh, font typeface for the equations. And as we see, MSHCA was opened up. And then... Da, 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 da. Then we see that we get a call out to zilp.pw. So all the end user sees is this uh, document with a bunch of gibberish in it, but in the background that equation editor has opened up with a vulnerable string that was passed to it and caused remote code execution to reach out and uh, reach out to that website. So we'll go through real quick on how to pull out this equation and kind of go through its structure a little bit and show you how to analyze it. What we're going to use is something called OLE tools. OLE tools has a bunch of stuff in it, as you see here. But one particular thing that we're going to use is RTF, uh, RTF object, and then we're going to give it the file that we want to analyze. And what this will show us is any OLE objects within the file. And as we see here, ID zero. There's an OLE object for an equation. So what we want to do is rip that out. And we do that by issuing the same command, but attack s, which means save object zero. And there we go. And there is object zero. So what we can do is throw that into Explorer. And then this is the raw data of the object. If we scroll down a little ways, you see here that you know Microsoft Equation Editor, cool, and then MSHCA, and there's the bad guys website. All right, cool. So to understand a little bit about this, we need to know um, a little bit about the structure of the. Ooh, too much of the equation and how it's laid out a little bit. So. Uh, where it starts is here at this uh, 3. You can see up here at the top of the structure 3, 1, 1, 3, A. So it ends here. And then the structure where the font will be passed in starts at 0, 08. Then the 5A, 5A. And here would be, as you see here in the example, like cmd.exe and, and, and the command that they want to pass. In Colin Hardy's video, which again I highly suggest you check out before this one, uh, is very similar to this. I think this MSHCA and the URL was actually up here, where the where the font should begin. But as you see in this one, um, that's not the case. It's it's down here, and it's past uh, null termination of zeros, so that's not being passed in at the same time for the typeface. So what's going on here? Um, just by looking at it, uh, you can kind of see that there's no null bytes or anything, so that's usually indicative of 
some sort of shell code and furthermore you kind of see here that that kind of looks like a little Indian address so if we come up here and explore go to disassemble and then we see here that uh, it does come out to valid assembly instructions so it could be shell code um, but to verify that we uh, we need to go ahead and debug the program and make sure for ourselves so there's a few different ways to do that um, as you saw before with API monitor uh, I had the location for equation editor and here it is if you're curious where it's at so there's a few different ways since Microsoft Office is starting this automatically um, we can't really you know quickly attach a debugger to it so we need some automate automated ways to do that um, so I have three different solutions for you uh, one is to modify the program directly so you can take the program put it in some sort of PE editor you can go and find the address of the entry point in this case here it is and then and then go to the entry point within the file and actually just replace the entry point bytes with EBFE and what that does is just an infinite loop so it, it, those are assembly, assembly instructions that tells it jump negative uh, one, two, negative two bytes, which means jump back to the EB, and then it just infinite loops. So anytime anything starts equation editor, all equation editors are going to do is sit there in a loop, and then you have time to go into your debugger, go and attach to it, and then pause it, replace the bytes uh, with the original bytes, and then continue execution, and you can attach to all sorts of programs that way. It's a little convoluted, but you do have to do that with malware sometimes, and that helps. So it's always good to remember to have this trick in your belt for the EBFE, and that will help uh, along your mal malware analysis uh, journey. But the second thing we can do is go into Registry Editor. And there's a very specific key in here. It's called Image Execution File Options, and it's located under H key local machine system current control set or no that's not right H key local machine machine software Microsoft uh, Windows NT current version image file execution options and then what you can do is place, uh, you have to copy the name exactly as it's going to show up in the process list. So EQN EDT 32.exe. You make, create a new key, which I've already done. And that's going to show up like this. And then you create a string value and you rename it debugger. And then the value that you're going to put in, in the debugger key it's going to be whatever debugger you want it to open. So in our case, we're going to use X32 debug. And now, whenever something opens, equation editor. So we can go back and just double click this document again. And we're cool. can see here down in the taskbar that X32 debug opened and now we are in equation editor 32. So we are actively debugging the program as soon as Microsoft Office started it. So that's a pretty cool, cool way to do it. Another option for us is to use something called GFlags. GFlags comes with the Windows debug uh, SDK. So G flags. Maybe. Right, where is it at? There it 
here it is. So global flags x86. And what you can do with this is same same thing we did before. Essentially, you have to type out the name, and then press tab, and then down here you can click the debugger setting, and then put in the same same path for your debugger that you want, and then hit apply. And what that'll do is the exact same thing that we did in the registry uh, manually. So anytime the question editor is launched, it'll launch the debugger attached to it instead. So that's very, very helpful. So with that under our belt, what we can do is go ahead and launch everything again. There it is. Sorry about that. Took a minute. All right. So we're going to skip ahead a little bit and we're going to go directly to where um, the buffer is called into, into place where it's taking in that um, the data from the equation editor object. And that is, we're going to stop at this return, the 411874. And the first time it hits it, that's not what we're interested in. We need to hit it one more time. And there we go. So if we go to our source address, which is ESI. Is it the uh, source of, there we go. Oh no, we already are at the return, my, my mistake. So we've already gone past, uh, and again, see Colin Hardy's video, great explanation of how we get to this point and how the buffer overflow actually works. Um, we're just gonna show how this one's a little bit different. So to understand a little bit, all right. So what we had is this portion here at V8, where the the uh, font was supposed to be. What we have essentially is shellcode. Uh, posing as a font name, and say so we'll do that because it's posing as a null terminate as a null terminated string. So nowhere in these bytes until the very end is there a null address. So what's going to happen is all of these bytes are going to overflow the buffer. So we're going down all the way to here. It overflows the return address, and the return address is this zero zero four zero two one one four. So if we go to that location. And as we see here, here it is on the stack. So 402114. Oops, wrong place. What that is, is that is legitimate code within the equation editor program. So it's returning to a return. So why would they do that? that that's a little odd. And in, uh, in Colin Hardy's example, they return to WinExec and then, you know, the the string to call out to the malicious website was already on the stack and when exec executed it. But here they're returning to a return. Why? Well, if you notice, so we'll go back to where we were. So we're going to execute one instruction. So we're going to return. Now we're at that return that they just returned to, return inception. And we see on the stack here that 18F350 is there. So we're about to return to that location. And then if we compare that with our bytes that we have in the OLE object, we see that B844EB71. So our theory about it being shellcode before was correct. So they're returning into another buffer that contains their OLE object. So if we step once, we see here, move 127 into EAX, and that lines up with what we had before. So it's a slight variation on the one that, uh, again, Colin Hardy mentioned in his video. This one is probably just trying to obfuscate things a little more. Instead of having the arguments directly in the uh, font space, they do a little shellcode magic here to go ahead and calculate some things. So these things, as soon as you XOR them together, what that equaled out to was that address in the AX. 
go to that address. We see that it calculated some address over an equation editor. Okay. And then if we dereference that value into EAX, keep going, keep going, and then there you see that they calculated the string that was included in their object to MSHTA, and that's what's going to cause um, call out to the malicious website. So if we keep going, keep going, you see here that they move some numbers into ESI, and then they export, and then you see that ESI is now resolved to WinExec within the equation editor. So they're about to call WinExec, and the argument that is pushed on the stack is MSHTA and the malicious website. So that, that's how they do it. That's just, um, again, very similar to Colin Hardy's. Um, it's just this MSHTA wasn't in the space here. It was the actual argument of where they're going to reach out to and try to download a file and execute it on the system. So again, we have the, the shell code that went all the way to the return address. We returned to a portion of equation editor that all it did was return. And it returned to a stack buffer address, which is where our original equation editor um, buffer was. So all of this stuff, which was shell code. So it executed all this, resolved some one exec, calculated some addresses to where MSHCA, that string was at the very end, and then called one exec, and that's how it reached out. So I hope this was informative. It was a little jumbled up. Um, again, highly suggest checking out Colin Hardy's video. Um, great depictions of how the stack and buffer overflows work, but I just wanted to show a different variant on uh, CVE-11882, the equation editor uh, buffer overflow. So if you all have any questions on this video or any of our other videos, hit us up at ringzerolabs.com and we'd be happy to help out.